So thank you for tuning in today's Health Philanthropy Summit. Again, it is underwritten and produced by Health Giving in partnership with our partners, the Ohio Association for Healthcare Philanthropy. We welcome their members. It is a great privilege to welcome you to another expert Q&A session. Um, Plan giving has a reputation for being scary, sometimes hard, and sometimes uh, no one other than the plan giving expert needs to know about. Uh, but we know that that's not true. The reality is that in order to truly build authentic partnerships with your donors um, and to under, you have to have an understanding of plan giving and you have to have a culture of collaboration between the fundraisers, between the plan giving experts and between all of the departments. So it truly is uh, a great privilege, as I said, to welcome an expert here for this Q&A session. Brad Blandon is the Vice President of Charitable Estate and Gift Planning for Bon Secor Mercy Health Foundation. The Bon Secor Mercy Health Foundation is a group of 14 foundation offices in, in six states, serving over 50 hospitals and uh, over a thousand sites of care. The foundation last year, 2020, raised over almost $70 million, uh, 68.3 actually, which exceeded their goals. And this year they're on course to have an even better year. And in that year, they earned the Association for Healthcare Philanthropy's high performer designation, both in overall and health system categories. And Brad oversees all plan giving for the entire health system. Um, prior to coming to work for Bon Secor Mercy Health Foundation, Brad was uh, with the law firm Robinson, Colfrey, and O'Connell in Toledo. He focuses on assisting successful high wealth individuals and individuals and families in identifying their goals in understanding their concerns and really developing great plans that are win-wins for the donor as well as for the foundation. And he's a great educator and teacher and expert. His experience in, in financial planning really helps as he works with his team and as he works with donors and potential donors and provides insight and unique perspective on gift planning and plan gifts. So Brad, welcome and, and, and let's let's jump right in. Uh, can you tell me a little bit, Brad, about your role with the uh, Bon Secor Mercy Health Foundation and, and what are some of the ways that you and your team have had success this year with plan giving? Sure, thanks, Bill, for uh, having me here today. Um, and so as you mentioned, uh, I joined Bon Secor Mercy Health Foundation approximately a year ago. Um, and prior to that, I had practiced law. And uh, prior to practicing law, I actually did financial planning for about five years. So I have a pretty diverse background when it comes to uh, plan giving, understanding the, the financial aspects as well as the legal aspects. Um, my role within the system is really to work with each of the, the market foundations that we have um, in the, the various locations. Each market has a market president, gift officers, and, and so on. Um, but my role is really to work with those gift officers and presidents to assist them as they work with donors who are looking to potentially make a planned gift. Um, over the last year or so, um, what I've really been focused on is kind of the, the education and the building the infrastructure. Prior to my joining the foundation, this is actually a new position with the foundation, um, and there was nobody kind of overseeing the, the plan giving role um, throughout the system. So really, the, the, the bulk of this past year has kind of been what I call infrastructure building, getting us to a point where we're building systems um, that we can um, not only uh, begin to pursue uh, plan gifts, but then administer them and, and make sure that we're stewarding them properly. So over the last year, the focus has really been educating gift officers and kind of building that, that infrastructure so that we can be successful in, in raising plan gifts. So Brad, we're, we're in the fourth quarter of 2021 here, um, and we're, you know, we're starting to put 2021 in our rearview mirror and looking forward to 2022. As you're sitting in the driver's seat, what, what are some of the trends that you see that are emerging in plan giving and things that we need to be thinking about as fundraising experts as we go into 2022? Yeah, sure. I, if I could say one thing that, that really stands out right now, and, and here we are, uh, you know, November, 
uh, it's uncertainty. Um, it, it's uncertainty in Washington, D.C. Um, there's a lot of talk about tax laws and changes there. There's uncertainty with the market. Um, today, the market happens to be way up. It's been way up this week. Next week, it'll probably be way down. It seems like it's kind of bouncing around all-time highs, but th there's a lot of uncertainty. Is it at a top? Is it going to you know, fall? Things like that. Um, there's also a lot of uncertainty around the economy. Um, inflation, is it here to stay? Is it transitory? Um, interest rates, are they going to start creeping up? You know, supply chain shortages, um, worker shortages, things like that. So uh, uncertainty seems to kind of be what the, the major theme is right now. And, and if we kind of look at that, how does plan giving fit in there? Well, Plan giving is really, I think, kind of transitioning to a, a position of helping people work through these uncertainties. Okay, um, I, I, I think a lot of plan giving is really um, being the calm in the storm with all these uncertainty and all these forces out there. Being calm and offering, um, you know, options and, and educating on different ways that that people can you know, make transformative types of gifts through plan giving um, that will, you know, very positively impact the communities they live in. Um, I, I think that is going to be really the key because I honestly, it's uncertain today. It's going to continue to be uncertain um, for, for some period of time here as we kind of work through the, the pandemic winding down, what's happening with the economy. So I, I think from a plan giving standpoint, <clears throat> As a, a, a gift officers and plan gifting um, uh, professionals, I think we really need to be able to kind of navigate through all these uncertainties and, and offer some clarity around vehicles that can be used with donors, um, you know, kind of moving forward. Much of it's going to be very fluid um, as new tax laws come out and, you know, changes different you know, tax breaks and things that, that might be beneficial today that are taken away or, or vice versa that are added. Um, so we're going to have to be quick. We're going to have to be ready to, to think on our feet and, and pivot where necessary as things evolve and come out of this uncertainty that we, you know, in which we live today. So there's still a lot of uncertainty and, and, and flexibility, but, but if you had a crystal ball, let's say, and you could predict the future, are, are there any types of plan gifts that that you would see as the primary types of plan giving vehicles going forward? You know, whether it's a giving through a retirement, an IRA, whether it's some form of life income, a charitable gift annuity, whether it's a bequest. You know, what should we be promoting um, as we go out and talk to people? And again, I'm asking you to look into a crystal ball. I know that there are some uncertain things, uh, but but what what should we be talking about? Hang on, let me get my crystal ball. You know, I'm just kidding. Um, so I, I think there's a few things that we should be looking at. One, uh, retirement accounts you mentioned. Um, those are, are very big uh, plan giving vehicles. I, I think sometimes underutilized. Back in my days of practicing law, if I had a client who had a, a charitable um, idea in their head and they wanted to, to you know, leave something to a charity, I always talked to them about using their retirement account. And, and the power of using retirement assets, I, I think, is something that's kind of flies under the radar. A, a lot of times people put money into 401ks over a lifetime haven't paid tax on it, it's grown had, and they have not had to pay tax on the, the appreciation. Um, if you leave that to a charity, nobody ever pays tax on that money that's put in, been put in there. But oftentimes um, that, that's not discussed quite enough. But I, I think where we're at today is most people, if you look at their retirement accounts, that's usually their largest asset that, that they have you know, right up there with their home. But that's a big vehicle that I think we need to be talking about, not only through beneficiary designations, but then also during lifetime, qualified charitable distributions. I think that's another big item um, that I think is, is often, you know, overlooked. Qualified just charitable distribution, basically, if you're over 70 and a half, it's a distribution directly to the uh, a charity right out of your retirement account. It doesn't go into your bank account, meaning you don't have to recognize it as income. Now, it's very powerful for those that have to take a required minimum distribution. Um, I often run into the, the, you know, folks that are you know, 70 plus and they have to take a required minimum distribution. And quite often they're saying, 
I don't want to take it because it makes me increase the tax rate that I have to pay on other income that I have. I don't really need it. I'd like to just leave it in there, yeah. but they have to take it. So qualified charitable distributions, I think, are, is a very powerful vehicle that people who give annually can use that to satisfy not only their, their annual charitable um, intentions, but also satisfy any required minimum distributions. Um, other popular vehicles, I think, um, it, one is going to be charitable gift annuities. Um, right now, we've got very low interest rates. Will they start ticking up? Probably. I don't think it'll go up dramatically, you know, quickly. But right now, you've got a lot of people who park money in a CD and maybe make, you know, a quarter of a percent for a year or so. Uh, um, a charitable gift annuity is something that offers them a better rate of return. It, it's guaranteed income, which it, with t- today's market, you're not getting a whole lot of guarantees. And it also gets them a, a charitable deduction. Um, and then ultimately, after they pass away, it goes to benefit the charity. So I, I think that's a very popular vehicle as well. Um, I will tell you that I think um, historically, plan giving, a lot of times people would think will, last will and testament and, and bequest. Yeah. While those are popular, I think they're declining in popularity. And, and the reason for that is what's happened is there's been so many vehicles that have been set up by legislatures throughout the, the United States that allow people to pass assets outside of probate to beneficiaries. And what does that mean? Well, a, a last will and testament's great, but it only controls assets in your probate estate. And most people are starting to pass assets outside of probate through beneficiary designations, entitling and things like that. So I, I think there's a real importance to, you know, yeah, talk about wills, but also talk about beneficiary designations and how things are titled as well. That's great. Brad, a, a portion of our audience has some plan giving experience, uh, maybe even expertise, but a lot of them are, are more the relationship major gift types that that plan giving isn't their expertise and then their experiences are, are, are few. I, I started this with saying, you know, plan giving has a reputation for being scary or or intimidating. And then I know you and I have talked about, you know, confidence, getting people confident in having the conversations with high net wealth individuals or donors who are talking or thinking about how to structure a bigger gift than usual. Um, what, what's some of your words of advice or how are you helping, you know, build confidence in getting people to feel comfortable having these in conversations and, and structuring gifts? Uh, what, what are your thoughts on that? So I, I will tell you that I, you, you know, gift officers, I, I hear that a lot. Well, I don't know enough about A, B, C, D, a laundry list of different vehicles and, and topics, and, and therefore I can't talk about plain giving. That's not true. Most people, if you talk to most donors, especially high wealth uh, or high net worth individuals, they don't know that stuff either. I mean, they, they have an idea, but they're relying on their own professionals to know that. What they're more concerned about is exactly what you said, the relationship. They want to know how much you care. They want to know that you're looking out for their best interest and, and trying to connect their passions with, you know, needs that are out there in the, the, in the communities. And, and so, you know, really plan giving is much more of a relationship um, focused or should be much more of a relationship focused um, process than really vehicle process and things like that. Um, I, you know, do gift officers need to know some basic information? Yeah, the, the, there's kind of the basics. And, and what I tell our team is, you know, my hope is to educate you and get you to a point where you can at least talk, you know, on the surface about different topics, whether it's a retirement account and, and things like that, but then be able to kind of pivot and say, you know what, would you like to know a little bit more about this type of vehicle? I'm not an expert in anything, but we have somebody that can come in and, and talk about these types of you know, things and, and give you a little bit more clarity. Um, and, and that's really the key. The, the key is to kind of get over that concern that I don't know enough um, and, and just go with what you know. Um, I'm here today as the, the, the so-called expert. And I will tell you, I don't know everything. And, and, you know, I'm not afraid to say if there's something new that comes up that, hey, let me get back to you on that. I need to go look and just, you know, confirm this. Um, and, and, and I think sometimes there's this thought that a plan giving professional needs to know everything. And, you know, that's not the case. I mean, yeah, you need to know some basics of a lot of different things. 
But I, I think a lot of the, the reluctance to talk about these types of things is really, um, you know, the reluctance is in between you know, your ears. So it's your, yourself um, building up the, these thoughts that I don't know enough to go out and do that. And really, I, I, I think most people have enough information to at least go have the conversation, get it started. That's great. So, so you're having a, a, a good year, 2021, with plan giving for the foundation. And, and so I want to ask you, you know, are there any specific experiences uh, as you kind of look back where, where you wish that, that you or perhaps someone on the foundation team and the major gift offs you're working with or others had done something differently uh, with a donor or, or even with their planned gift? And if you were allowed a do-over, what, w- what would you change? Mm-hmm. It, you know... There's a couple um, examples that I'm thinking of. One is actually not when I was, um, you know, in my current role. It was back when I was practicing law. And uh, I was early in my career. And I remember uh, I was meeting with a a client to go through his high net worth and, you know, go through a a variety of options that he had to reduce taxes in his estate plan. And, And boy, it was a really good, you know, list of every conceivable option out there. Um, and it was incredibly boring looking at it in hindsight. And, and what I did is I went to this person, gave them about 10 different options, high technical tax lingo and, and language that at the end, you know, I probably went on for a good hour, given all these options and everything. He said, Brad, what would you do? And, and that was a very powerful lesson that, you know, yeah, identify options. I think options are good for, for donors, for clients. But then you need to be prepared to say, I think this really fits for you, and here's why. Um, and, and, you know, in that process of laying out the options, you know, I kind of abide by the, 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 the KISS principle, you know, keep it simple. Is, um, there's a lot of value in that. If you can keep it simple and then be prepared to say, this is, uh, yeah, I think this really fits for you, here's why, I think that's something that um, could be very powerful. Um, as far as experiences that we've had, um, there, there, there's been a couple of gifts um, that, that have come in that, um, quite honestly, we, we didn't know about. And, and they come in and it's maybe out of an estate or you find out that there was um, a retirement account there. And kind of going back to earlier when I said retirement accounts are a very powerful vehicle, I, I, you know, I wish we would have been in touch and, and stewarded it a little bit better so that we could talk to them. Hey, we know you want to leave, you know, some, some a portion of your estate to to the foundation. Is this the most efficient way for you? And, and kind of talk to them about that. Now we're getting better at that, but I think that that's something that oftentimes, you know, you you, you get a plan gift on the books, and it's like great, you know, they they, they left us in a will, and and you move on. Um, but sometimes it, it's a matter of saying, okay, this is wonderful, and you know, I don't want to. Uh, you know, I, I want to make sure I appreciate or thank you and appreciate, show the gratification for the the, um, the gift. But is there a more efficient way that's a really a powerful win-win? It, it, it maybe leaves more to their other beneficiaries or, or their heirs. It still has the same effect for, for the foundation and the charity as well. So it really, it, it's, I you know, if there's one thing that I see, it, it's really being able to kind of dig a little bit deeper. Don't just accept a gift at face value, dig a little bit deeper, ask some questions without being invasive or, or, or nosy, but ask a little bit more and, and see if there's an, opportun- an opportunity to, to maybe um, do it in a different way that is a little bit more efficient and, and beneficial to, to the donor. So, you know, to ask a few more questions and other things, and oftentimes when we bring opportunities to you, you have to react versus being proactive because we've been engaged yeah. in these relationships or, or we've been working with donors or others. So, so if there was some advice that you could say, like what, what you wish everyone was doing as they're engaging in these conversations, what is that? What, what do you wish everyone was doing or, or knew to do and, and, and why? Yeah, you know, I, I, I think really the, the big thing is um, it, asking more questions. Um, I, you know, I, I don't feel that people ask enough questions to get information. And, and um, recently I was with uh, in one of our markets and we were with a donor and um, he was leaving a gift and he has a lot of wealth. And 
quite honestly, I, I just, it, it was a little um, uh, wine and cheese event afterwards. It, I talked to him briefly and, and I can probably count on one hand the no, uh, amount of words that I said. It was really listening to him and, and through listening, I walked away with a real good sense of what his net worth was, what his passions are, um, you know, things like that, that it, 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 you know, I could have asked a bunch of questions, talked about different things, but I don't think I would have gotten the same information out of him. So I, I think really listening is kind of the, the big question um, that, or the big thing that people need to do a little bit better. Um, the other thing that I wish people would do is ask more information like when we find out uh for example that we're uh, a beneficiary in a will finding out you know do they have assets that are actually going to go through probate you know um asking some of those follow-up questions that uh, again a lot of times we just take it at face value oh we're named in the will we're named here and it, it ends at that but i i think there's a lot of room to ask follow-up questions around you know, whether there's going to be a probate estate and even further, how do you want this gift to be used? Um, you know, so often somebody will name us in a will or, or in a trust and they don't want to, you know, give us exact dollar amounts and things like that. But talking to them a little bit about how do you want this to be used? You know, we, you know, we want to make sure that your wishes and your intentions are, are um, you know, acted upon after you're no longer around. So asking a little bit more about um, how it would be utilized, how they want it to be utilized, usually is going to lead to a better relationship and the donor ultimately being willing to reveal a little bit more information as well. That's, that's, that's great advice. So, um, you know, we hear this saying often, the silver tsunami or the, the aging of baby boomers. And, and you know, we're, we're starting an experience where the, the GI generation has passed off and and died and passed their wealth on to the baby boomers. There's a lot of these baby boomers. They either inherited some wealth or they've generated some wealth. And they're now starting to think, you know, the silver tsunami passing on their legacy, their wealth and other things. So, it, you know, your thoughts on that, the, the, that silver tsunami, and then, and then what else is on the horizon for healthcare nonprofits and, and their plan giving initiatives that you're paying attention to? Mm -hmm. So it, I, I was, listening to i think it was a webinar by uh dr russell james and one of the the observations he had as a result of his research that he had done was people who have a charitable component in their estate plan live longer you know there, there's been this this you know this wave of wealth that was going to transfer and, and charities have kind of been waiting. When is that happening? And it keeps going up. Well, the reason it hasn't happened quite as quickly as, as you know, initially predicted is these people are just living longer. So um, I, I think there's a lot of opportunities um, there to stay in touch with those elderly folks because, you know, charities are probably named in those uh, uh, people's estate plan but usually those people tend to become a little bit less mobile, a little bit less involved and, and things like that. So that really highlights the, the need and importance for the stewardship aspect um, in order to steward those gifts and make sure that they ultimately come in. Um, I, I think the same thing is, as it, it, it's going down to the baby boomers, they're a little bit younger now, but they're going to have the same conversations. Um, a lot of people, and this kind of started when I was practicing law, you started to see people that, that had wealth and realized that they didn't want their kids getting everything. A lot of people are very open to the idea of how do I benefit my community? How do I make a lasting impact on my community? I'm not saying all of their estate will go towards that, but you know, the people are open to the, the baby boomers are open to, to having that discussion. Really, what they need though is to be educated on what opportunities are out there. Um, you know, where are ways that I can engage and, and benefit the community I, I, in, in which I leave and leave a, la a lasting impact um, through my estate plan? So I, I think it really highlights the need to educate on opportunities that are out there and uh, help engage, you know, the next generation in, in the philanthropy pro <clears throat> excuse me, process. As far as the healthcare question, what do I see happening there? Um, if we kind of go back to the economy question, 
um, you know, what's going on right now? Well, uh, across the country, you're seeing labor shortages and, and there's no shortage of nursing, you know, doctors, all that. What does that mean? Every health system is having to pay more to, you know, recruit and, and keep these people. So those costs are going up. Um, the, the inflation's starting to get baked into the costs and process or um, prices and everything. What does that mean? Well, everything that's purchased by, you know, health organizations, that cost goes up. Why do I bring that up? The needs are still gonna be there. The, 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 um, the need for healthcare, the, the need to help those that are a little bit less fortunate to receive proper healthcare, those needs aren't gonna go away just because there's inflation and labor. So how do we continue to meet that need? I, I would suggest that healthcare organizations are gonna have even greater needs as a result of the cost pressures continuing to go up, yet the number of people, and, and it seems like that number of people that are kind of um, you know, underserved, if you will, that continues to increase. So how do we make sure that even the, the less fortunate are, are taken care of in, in our community? So I, I think there's gonna be even more focus on how do we raise dollars to continue to have transformative delivery of healthcare in, in you know, our communities. And then really the final thing with healthcare, I think there's kind of a, a transition going on, which is more, before it was services rendered, that's how people were compensated, um, health systems. I, there's this switch in, in a mindset of going from, you know, just treating to being proactive, lifestyles and, and working, um, you know, to, to get people living a healthy lifestyle so they don't necessarily need as many um, health services later on and kind of prevent some of the preventable diseases that we see. So I, I think the, the focus of um, plan giving in healthcare is, is really going to, there's going to be a lot of needs and, and increasing needs, but there's also going to be the opportunity to, to raise funds uh, to, to, you know, fund, um, you know, kind of the proactive approach to healthcare as opposed to the reactive approach. Excellent. Well, so Brad, we're, we're, we're closing in on the end of our, our time here together. So this is really kind of the summary question, if you will. Is, is there anything that we're leaving out here that, that needs to be addressed? Any any parting words to the fundraising experts in healthcare that, that are here on the, and tuned in uh, that you would provide? Yeah, I, I think really the, the final piece of advice is, I mean, you're going to need to stay tuned to what's going on in, in DC and, and tax law changes, that will greatly impact what happens with philanthropy. Now, the one thing I will say is, you know, estate tax is a great example, okay? Everybody worries that the estate tax exemptions, exemption is gonna come back down and, and that'll trigger a bunch of philanthropy and stuff, true. But, but so much of tax law really doesn't have an impact on uh, philanthropy. Yeah, people may take advantage for the tax deduction, avoid taxes, things like that. But so much of the, the impactful philanthropy that you see through plan giving is, is coming from people who really just have a desire to impact their community um, and, and make a positive and leave a positive um, mark on, on you know, the places where they live. And, and so plan giving, I think... It, 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 it's easy to get distracted with all the noise. Don't get distracted. Yeah, the tax laws, that all kind of works in there and it's good, it's a nice benefit, but really focus on the passions of, of the, the donors who want to do plain gifts um, because I, I, I think there's even more of them out there than, than there has been in the past, especially coming through the pandemic and it's kind of hit home in a lot of communities. There's a lot of opportunity to go out and raise, you know, plant significant amounts through plan gifts that will really leave a lasting impact. That's excellent. Well, Brad, I, I thank you for your time. Again, you know, what a great privilege to to have you as one of our experts here and to do this Q and A for our Health Philanthropy Summit this year. And and so we really appreciate it. And and thanks again. Thank you, Bill. It's been a pleasure.